been a while since I've wrestled with a, not a text, but to concisely bring things together, what I see and perceive God is doing. We are, so a few thoughts led me to this moment. I am um, had a few conversations with people in church that have close friends and family that once served Jesus, but now no longer. Now they are, call themselves Christian Buddhists or they see themselves as New Age people because once they were faithfully worshiping Jesus, but now they, they've broadened their scope and they view that, you know, all religions take people to God, God is one mediator, you know, things like that, really concerning for people. And having to question your faith, why do I believe what I believe? Um, had some, we are looking forward to next year and are planning and um, we're really excited. It, I think it's the, probably, Melissa, the, the most proper planning we've had done before so some people like Willem and Dale you will be so you will be so impressed you will be so impressed yeah it's like a if you approve it Dale if the elders approve it anyway and um so that's in my head and and one of the blocks that I'm most excited about is it's just looking at God and creation and our, our participation with God in this world and looking through the book of Deuteronomy just studying the book of Deuteronomy as a as a book that how, the question you have to ask yourself is how, how did it happen that four million illiterate, poor, underfed slaves saved from Egypt, the mightiest empire, in a span of 250 to 300 years became such a strong, enduring, affluent nation? I mean, how does that happen? How does it happen? I mean, yes, your answer is God. It's like the, you know, the Kinderkerk antwoord. It's Jesus, ne? How? How, how did, and the book of Deuteronomy is the answer. It's, it's an incredible book of how God formed society to not just for this generation, but for generations to come. So that today still the most influential, most affluent, most powerful people in the world is a small Jewish nation, small tribe of people, powerful, something that God has done there. That is still, so you have to ask yourself, how did that happen? So those were my thoughts. And um, a moment last week, yesterday, uh, last week, Melissa's message really touched me deeply, like really deeply. The question she asked is, how did, how did God, if, if we are slaves in our sin and have become freed men participating with God in his kingdom, then I've never seen it like this in all my Bible study. But then Joshua is probably the one person that you want to see follow his track. How did he, this young slave, become this powerful leader, understanding that he is a, that he is a chosen, loved person in the kingdom of God to possess seven Canaanite kingdoms? I mean, how, how did it happen? Same question. And it's really helpful. But once he, he just mentioned one, at one point the phrase priestly moments in this man's life, encounters, if you read through Numbers and Deuteronomy specifically. You can start in Exodus. But just to track this man's life, to see how did he change? How, how, what made him view himself, the world, his people, and God differently? Those moments that really transformed him. So those, that phrase, priestly moments, stood by me. So in, in the side, I'm working through the ancient paths of Craig Hill. Just uh, about priestly moments, moments with your in your life where you have to come to grips to who I am, who God is, and how do I fit in this world, but also to facilitate that to my own children, um, wrestling through reality that, that I'm living in this world, and our world is an extremely secular world. So just the next slide, Mackie, if you can help me there. Thanks. So with our secular age, if we talk about, because the question is, how do I, how do I remain faithful to God in this secular age? How do, I, how do I not become a secular person? How do I not become like some of our family and friends that, that once served Jesus faithfully, but now, you know, they don't really. Now they serve money. Or maybe they're still Christian in name, like 75% of this country, but won't, won't pause too long to steal something from your car if your door is open, you know. <laughs> how do you do that, you know? How do you remain faithful to God? And um, so I read and I studied a bit into, into Charles Taylor, uh, professor, Canadian professor in philosophy. 
and um, Christian philosophy and, and Jamie Smith. You've heard me quote his name so many times. Just reading through their works, and I just want to take this moment because I want you to plot our world. If we, if we talk about living in a secular world, there are three usages in, in both Taylor and, uh, and James Smith's commentary on Taylor. So if you're really not into philosophy and thinking, then the next five minutes, you can just doze off. I want to, however, I want to challenge you to not do that. Because it is helpful if you want to know what God must save me from, then you should probably know where from is. <laughs> what is Egypt? You know, where are we now? So anyway, so that he uses three, three phrases. Taylor in his massive book, about 900 pages, massive, massive book. Um, and James Smith is the one that you want to read because it's a 160, a commentary on that to dumb it down for us. Né? And he's saying, listen, so there are basically three usages. He, James Smith says that Taylor uses a secular one, secular two, and secular three. Three definitions, three phrases. The first one is the one that, that we are familiar with. That in the 1500s, before the Reformation, there were people that were holy and had a holy life. Holy vocation, priests, people living in monasteries, people set aside for God, holy living. So this is holy living. And then on the other side, you had the farmers and the carpenters and the blacksmiths and the builders and public servants <laughs> who were common. Eh? Lawyers. Eh? So on this side, you had the holy people and the secular. There was a big divide between the holy and the secular. And we still use that word, although we frown upon it. We, we still understand that still a framework that still exists today. It hasn't died out. So a few years later, um, and especially if you've been following Western politics, American politics, uh, starting in Europe and then going into America, and all over in the pressure in South Africa, is to remove the holy or religion from society. No longer do we pray to the Lord Jesus Christ in Parliament, that's just 30 years ago. And in our schools, we don't pray anymore to Jesus. Well, there's pressure to not do that. We all do still, but <laughs> there's pressure to not do that. That we don't use the Bible as a baseline for, for moral upbringing in our schools anymore because we should divide the secular and the holy. There's, there's not like a special place for religion anymore. It's, the point is, it's one of many ideas. So that's sort of the second way, the subtraction idea of secular. Becoming secular means not being religious anymore, removing prayer and worship and scripture from our society. And then a third way of using the, the concept of secular in our society is what, is what Charles, um, Charles Taylor refers to as the, the nova effect, the supernova effect, the nova effect. He says the irony is that progressively since the printing of the first Bible and the Reformation and the Enlightenment era, progressively, because, because people have found rational ideas or answers, explanation of why the world works as it should. You know, in the past, people, the Canaanite people and, and, and Jewish followers of, of, of God would, would pray to God for rain to send rain but now people know that the rain doesn't come because God sends it. The rain comes because there's a cold front bringing brick waves to Cape Town, you know? It's, it's the cold front. It's the sun and the earth and the 60 degree angle, you know? That's the reason why we have seasons. It's not God changing the seasons or the gods changing the seasons. So progressively people have been thinking through life as in this way. It's like, in the past, we had an enchantment, James Smith's view. He says, enchanted view of creation, of God being everywhere and the whole place being filled with spirits. It's not just the material world, but the supernatural. There's something else here. But progressively, people have moved away from that idea and the Bible and God is not the center of our universities all around the world or the center of our medical services around the world, but science is, rational thought is. And he says, this is the irony. <laughs> he says, the irony, because of the fact that we have, we deny the presence of God in everything, 
or the spirit world and everything, ironically, it's not as though people have become more atheist. Ironically, there is a supernova explosion of spirituality all around the world because, he, to use N.T. Wright's phrase, we're all haunted by God. <laughs> it's like we've removed God from the house, but God is still in the house. You know, it's like there's still a spirit here. God is still here. We, we cannot deny this yearning on the inside of not just individuals' lives, but society as a whole and creation as a whole. The rational answers have not taken away the desire and the longing in the hearts for God. And so they're writing to say that this is, and it's amazing if you look at all around the world, it's not as though people are praying less now than 50 years ago. People are praying more. People are praying to anything and everything. So we just back into pagan, pagan, pagan worldview. Now. <laughs> We're praying to everything. And he's saying this is the, and, and one of the things that I just want to highlight here, and this is where I want to move towards uh, how to not become secular. That's my question. How do I not become secular? Because this poses so much pressure of doubt on you and your children and your neighbors. It poses so much doubt. Because in the past 100 years ago, or 500, I mean in the 1500s, it was unthinkable for someone to not believe in God. No? It's unthinkable for someone not to not, you'd be burned at a stake if you don't believe in God. Today, if you want to speak on behalf of God, they'll put you in a loony bun. It's unthinkable in many spheres today that you believe in God. I mean, literally, do you really believe that God created stuff? Come on, man. So we're on the opposite sides. So today, because of the explosion, the supernova effect, this exploding star of spiritualities all around, of ideas, today, the pressure of doubting is incredible on you and the people around you. Every form of literature, every form of art, every, every song, every movie, every book, every thing your child will be taught, every time you switch on National Geographic, if God is not the answer for the amazing stuff that you see, that is science, you know, rational development, evolution, this stuff, stuff. So we live in a society that is increasingly pressuring us to question our faith. And he's, this is the one thing that I want to, so one of the greatest contributors, the surprise factor here for you. So this is where you can shut back. You can come in. Those who are out, you can come in now again. The surprising factor is that in Charles's research, and James Smith expounds on it nicely. The surprising fact is that one of the greatest contributors to this supernova effect, to the fact that people believe now in anything and everything and weirds. In the past, you had five branches of religion. Now you have five billion options because it's a privatized religion. Choose what you want to believe because, you know, the power's out there and the power's in you. God is in you. God, you know, whatever. And one of the reasons is, he's saying, is Protestantism. The advance of Protestantism around the world. Because Protestantism have moved away intentionally from ritual and ceremony. Incarnational living. Intentionally moving away from ritual and ceremony because it's associated to some weird ideas. We have all drunk from the rational mindset where belief in God for the Protestant Christian around the world is cognitive development. Facts, truth. I mean, praise God for the centrality of the Bible, né? the centrality of the word in everything. But for many, for most Protestants around the world, for most Christians around the world today, religion or faith is cognitive development. It's a set of beliefs that you memorize when you're young, Heidelbergse Katechismus, and you pray it and you think it. And salvation works like this, systematic theology. Jesus, the Son of God, gave truth, and God works like this, and marriage works on these principles, and to be a godly person in society works on this, and how we work with my money is this set of beliefs. So it came to be developed as a worldview, and there are approximately 1,500 books written on the Christian worldview that are influential all around the world because Christianity has become a worldview. 
a way of viewing the world. It's, it's a cognitive development. So, now, <laughs> so that means everything else we do in life is experiential and our faith is internalized cognitive development, a set of beliefs. And James Taylor wrote five books before this one, arguing like, what's going to win? A class about morality and life for the teenager or a great party inf telling you that this is the better life. <laughs> so this is the big thing that he's saying. But the tremendous faith. So that's where I want to come to. So starting. So that's why Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. Another way to say this exactly is do not be secular in your thinking. Don't be transformed to this world. And remember the world into which Paul wrote was very similar to the world into which we write if you're a Westerner. So when South Africa is still very protected here in the northern suburbs and in Noordelike Voorstede, Baie, but now we're going to live in New York, we're going to live in Delhi, we're going to live in London, we're going to live in Cape Town proper, and you will find that Christianity, true belief in Jesus, is a small minority to many other options that is pressurizing you to conform to their way of thinking because all of society and every movie and every art form and every business interview and every set of uh, books educates you in the way of the Chaldeans, the way of the people around you. And he's saying, don't be conformed, don't be secular in your thinking, but be transformed by the reading of your mind that we may know what God really, really, really wants from us. So with that in mind, I want you to um, just consider the book of Deuteronomy, and the next year in, from July, for two months, we will go into the book nicely and study it, uh, and our hope and our desire is to really give you a devotional reading for that time, for at least every week, just a devotional reading through the book so we can look at the highlights in the book. But the question is, God, we are not the first generation to face our secular world. How did you do this before? So I'm not going to look at Romans, I want us to look at Deuteronomy. It's the first time that God said, this is how my kingdom works, this is how life works, this is how you will flourish. Let my kingdom come, hear yeah, Moses, this is my law, this is a way to live. And I just want to say for our Protestant thinking, because all of us, I think most of us are strongly influenced, you know, we still have in our heads this idea that the Old Testament law, it's out. Jesus came to wipe it away, no? to wash it away. <laughs> but Jesus really came to fulfill, to bring the fulfillment of that. So this is what, so the gift of the priest is what I want to focus on today, the gift of priestly moments. Mediation, the priest is given to mediate. God didn't just give a law, God gave the law with a priest. God gave the law with a priest, with a temple, a place where the God of heaven dwells, a place where heaven meets earth, a place geographically where there's a touch point where the Jews live to, with, from, and for God. Where Jews live, they, they, they immerse themselves in ritual, in ceremony, in the reality that life truly is in, for, with, and from God. Everything flows to and from God. A hill, a high point on a mountain in Zion where there's a tabernacle and later a temple where we can meet with God, the God of heaven, and we live and we move in him. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. Paul rephrases Greek poetry in Acts chapter 17. So the reality of life in God and for God. And the role of the priest really is to teach the precepts, to teach people the law. To say, people, this is how God wants us to live. This is shalom. This is how the kingdom works. This is how life works. If you want to flourish, this is, this is the law. Live in this way. When it comes to, and you'll see in the books of Deuteronomy, family, civil life, how you do business, how you do money, how we do sanitation, how do we do health care, how do we do governance, how do we do every sphere of society. This is how God transformed the small four million illiterate Jews to become this powerful nation. And the point of Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 1 to 10 says, why do I give you this? Because I love you so much. That when people see you flourish, they will say, wow, what a great God. What a great God you have. What a great God you have. Just some background. The book of Deuteronomy is phrased 
in a, in a, in a Hittite Cimmerian treaty. You know, they, they traveled, Moses and the people traveled through the wilderness and then came to the eastern side of the Jordan. And as they entered Canaan in the eastern side of the Jordan, they had conflict with Och, king of Bashan. And what was the other king's name? Och, king of Bashan and the other king. Um, those two major kingdoms, they conquered them. And then he said this thing. He said to them, okay, good, so now let's rephrase the law for you again, Deuteronomy. Let's give it a second time, just before you enter into this wilderness. You've been tracking for 40 years. Your fathers have all passed away. Let's just give the law of God again. But he, then he reframed it in a different way, in this Cyrenian type covenant. He framed it in a way in which if a, if Ochi, king of Bashan or some Hittite king, some Canaanite king would come and conquer another nation. He would say, okay, this is the pact with which we will live. If you want to, now that you are my people, now that you are subject to me, if you want to live well, we're going to live this way. So he gives them precept to say, now that you are part of my empire, I will protect you. I will care for you. But this is how you will adjust your way of living so that we can have a good relationship, so we can have peace. So the book of Deuteronomy is given exactly in that form. To say, now if you, now that you are my people, I have saved you. I've shown my power to you. Now that you are my people, if you want to live well, live this way. And that's what he gave. And he gave them the law, and he gave them the priesthood. Two things, to teach the law, and secondly, ritual. To make touch points where we are reminded viscerally that we live in, for, and from God. That's it. We live in, for, and from God. It's just beautiful. Deuteronomy chapter 26. Ek gaan nie baie lang praat nie, maar ek weet ek het nou lang einde. Was it a good introduction? I think, thank you. Thank you so much. So Deuteronomy chapter 26 is a longer chapter. I took the first 15 verses. And this I just want to give you as a, as an example. It's a very good example of how to not be secular. What did God say to the Jews, that, to the Israelites, the Hebrews that entered into the promised land? You will live among the Canaanites. They do things in another way. They do off things. He says, don't be like that, but live like this. And it's very practical. And what I want you to see is if you read this, you will see it's so in photo. It's ordinary life that you and I can relate to. It's so simple. It's about work and money and strangers, foreigner people with you and about the temple and about provision and about welfare and about security. Everyday normal life. One of the many chapters in the book of Deuteronomy. When you've entered the land, standing on the eastern side of the Jordan River just before he's dying, Moses stood on the mountain again, and he said, here's the Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, the second giving of the, the covenant. Let me read it to you. And in chapter 26, he says, when you will enter on the other side, the Lord, Yahweh there, the covenant God, the Lord your God has given you as inheritance and have taken possession of it and have settled in it. Then take some of the first fruits of all that the produce from the soil of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, put it in a basket, says Roy Kapi, and go to the temple. Then go to the place where the Lord your God is, will choose as a dwelling for his name, to Zion, Jerusalem. And say to the priest in the office, when you get there, there will be a priest. You're going to have a meeting with a priest. By a lacquer. At that time, I declare on an oath, I make an oath, this is my way of starting this conversation, I declare today to Yahweh, the God, that I have come to the land that the Lord swore to to our ancestors to give to us. Beautiful, eh? You come with your monkey and you say, this is me, I have a piece of land because God, you said I'm gonna have a piece of land and this is what I have brought from my land. Da -da -da -da. And then the priest shall take the basket from the hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord, your God. Then you shall declare, this is your oath. My father was a wandering Armenian. He went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. You remember your story of how you got here. But the Egyptians mistreated us. They made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice, and he saw our misery, our toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terrors and signs and wonders. 
goodness gracious, great walls of fire. And he brought us to this place, and he gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, this is me, a few hundred years later, and I bring the first fruits of my soil to you, Lord, because you gave me this land. Beautiful, eh? And then he says, then you will bow down and worship God. And when you've finished setting aside the tenth of all your produce in the third year, the third year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat, they who cannot possess any land, that they too may eat and be satisfied. Then say to the Lord your God, I've removed from my house the sacred portion that's yours and given it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all you commanded. Look down from heaven, from your holy dwelling, from which this temple is a gateway, <laughs> and bless your people Israel and the land you've given to us, and you've promised on an oath to our ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. I love this text. I love this simple text, because if you think about it, it's, it's so practical. We talk about... And not, and not a disembodied faith, but a very incarnational faith. My faith with God has to do with my land, my produce, me, how I got here with my fathers. My faith has to do with these foreigners that came from Rwanda and Zimbabwe and from Angola and from Mozambique and fled here because their country is in a mess. And with a man who lost with a woman who now lives as a widow looking after her children who can't look after herself, the orphans in the land. Very practical. My faith has to do with this society. This is not a privatized faith. This is not a faith that is an idea that one day when Jesus comes back, poof, he will fly me to the moon and to the heavens and I'll be with him forever. This is a faith that has to do with God and this world. And this city in which I dwell, this is a faith that has to do with the efforts of my hand combined with God's grace that gives something in my hand that is sufficient for me and my household. And that God says, remember, you too were a sojourner, were a, were a traveler, a wanderer that had no land. But now you are blessed because I made a covenant with you and I blessed you. Now you be a blessing to those around you. And it centers around temple and priesthood. It centers around a moment, a touch moment, a touch moment, not an idea, a touch moment where I go, I am an Israelite. I'm a child, an heir of the covenant of God. And that's why I'm on this piece of land. And this is my story and this is my song. This is where I come from. This is me. This is God looking after me. This is the God who cares for the foreigners and the oppressed. This is the God who cares for everyone. And now I'm participating with you. I love it. It's not an idea. It's a practice. It's something that God says, if you want. And you, you can think about this. I mean, there's a reason why he left his home. In the far country and traveled for two days with a monkey full of stuff, Roy Kapi, when he wolf. And he walks and his son says, Dad, where are you going? This is our first grapes, Dad. Can I have some? And God, he says, You can't touch this. No way. You don't touch these grapes. You don't touch these grapes. Why, Dad? This is God. He says, But it's yours, Dad. <laughs> I worked on this farm. And he says, No, walk with me. And there's this whole ceremony where he lays it down and he makes an oath and the son hears the story of, okay, so this grapes has a story. These grapes have a story. These grapes have a great legacy. These grapes has got something to do with God's covenantal blessing that we live in and from God. And at the end, the priest speaks a blessing over me again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May you dwell in shalom. And I walk home because this is a moment where I realize that everything that I do on the farm has got to do with everything that God has been doing on earth for a very long time at this temple, this place where heaven meets earth. And this simple priest, a normal man, gives and shares freely.
and saying, God bless you. You receive this as a gift and you go away. And I also understand that what I give on this third year will go to the foreigner from Zimbabwe, will go to the man who lost his father, will go to the widow who no longer has a piece of property to care for, and will go to the Levite who have given up his right to produce for himself so he can serve God's people because God is his portion. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's just, I love this. I love this. This is an everyday life. This is how can I relate to this text? Well, this is everyday life. This has to do with land, our biggest issue in South Africa, with work and with money. This is our story, now. It has to do with those who have and it has to do with those who don't have. It has to do with money and the meaning of life and the meaning of money and the, and the purpose of money. It has to do, it's a text that we can relate to. This is, this is me and my work, me and my life. This is everyday stuff, this. And if we look at this text, not just as a mirror to see myself, that was the previous slide, thanks, Mackie, is, but as a window into God's kingdom. If we look at this text, next year, a window into God's realm, then I love this text it shows me, it shows me, it highlights the fact that God is a covenant God. Two weeks ago, I had a very profound meeting up here with God just one morning in my prayer time. And it has everything to do with God of covenant. The fact that God is not just my God, but God is the God of Anna Marie and Willem, my parents, of Ross and of Nathan and Marguerite. He's the God that isn't just concerned with me, that doesn't just bind himself to me, but God who really does bind himself to Nathan and Marguerite, our children, for his sake. He's a God that doesn't just choose me. He's not just a God of my individual choice. He's a God that will and has always been faithful to caring for not just for Abraham, but for Isaac and Jacob and the generations to come. He made a covenant to David and his descendants. Even if they rebel, he says, I will love him and favor him. I will discipline him. But God says, I am that God that is not just concerned with you. It's not just a privatized individual faith, but it's a God of covenant. I love this. I love this text because this little man who brings his monkey to the temple is reminded by the oath that he makes. I remember my story, God. It started, <laughs> it started with Joseph and Jacob. Israel went into Egypt. We multiplied for 400 years, and that's where my story starts. We cried out, and you saved. And you said, a land flowing with milk and honey, because you made a covenant with Abraham. And in one sense, it's not about me and my goodness. Because I didn't earn this land. I didn't earn this blessing because of my efforts. I'm a recipient of your grace. I am a recipient of your grace. This is not because I'm so good that we have this produce, but I'm going to give this to you because, God, you made a vow that you will give us a land flowing with milk and honey. And these grapes, God, is a gift that I've received from you and that we receive from you. And this is simply a token to say, God, we will now and forever be dependent on your grace. Receive this as a gift, God. Offering of thanks. Amazing. Covenant, God of covenant, God not of earning, God of grace, recipient. And, and what, what I mean with incidental is the little man who brings his offering recognizes that God is going to bless his children as well because they will also be the children of Abraham. It's more in there. I'm giving you this. This is my land. This is my gift. But God... My boy who's next to me who observes this everything, one day he will bring this as well because of your faithfulness. We are a demonstration of your goodness. Our riches, our gifts are a demonstration in how we receive it and how we share it. It's a demonstration of your goodness. The next one is just the pivot. And I mentioned this a few times, but the window into God's realm. I can see God's realm, God's way of living also in this this tabernacle priest contact point here. We live to and from God's presence. We live to and from God's presence. It's not privatized, it's public. Priest 
mediates between the eternal God of covenant, the creator of heaven and earth, the savior of Israel, and this little man who comes to God. The priest facilitates and mediates. The priest helps the man to set a culture where he can come to stand before God, not just to in his head go like, I know everything I have is from God. No, this is a moment. This is a moment where everything that I have is yours. This is a moment where I make a moment of it, where we stop, where I have to stop my whole life and to say, wow, it's a great harvest, or it wasn't a great harvest, but this is what I have. Thank you, God. Thank you. God, I have this because of your promise to Abraham. You are a faithful God. You are a faithful God. That's it. It's a moment. And then he walks back and he tells this kid the story again. And it's a tabernacle. It's a moment where God meets. We live with, from, to, and for God. I mentioned that a few times. And then the, the invitation for us. How is this text an invitation for Ross and I think for us? And this is where I want to invite you into. <clears throat> I think you can see that this text isn't an Old Testament that we can throw away, no? This isn't something of law that you throw away. I mean, if you have that notion in your head, just kill it as hard as you can and just stay in the Old Testament for three months. Ne? Just read the law again and see that this is not dead religion. This is how to live with the God of covenant, the Father of Jesus. So in this text, what I love is this priestly moment and the priest does two things. He sets the rhythm for life, celebration of the seventh feast of Israel, the Sabbath, and then he has ritual points, touch points, priestly moments where we come together. It's whenever there's a great feast and you remember that we, the feast of Passover or the feast of tabernacles or the feast of harvest or the feast of trumpets announcing that God will come, any of those feasts is a touch point, but he does more than that. You've had many priestly moments when you got married. The moment where you stood before God and it's a moment where he says, okay, this relationship is in, is from, is for, is unto God. And you make a vow in the presence of God, remembering that he made them Adam and Eve and he bound them together to govern the earth with them. And this is a covenant moment, a priestly moment where a priest oversees it. Or there was a priestly moment, perhaps, at the death of a relative, where the priest would come and officiate the burial and to say, this life is from dust to dust. <laughs> a gift from God, a gift that served God, and now we greet this person. But one day when, we, when he returns, he will raise the dead. You know, a priestly moment, or a priestly moment when your child was born. And you stood before God and you brought him on ceremonially in Deuteronomy, in Exodus chapter 22. On the eighth day, you brought this child. It's more in the eighth day. God created everything. Day one to day seven, the eighth day. This is Adam and Eve's creation. <laughs> it's God's creation, but it's our participation. Keep and cultivate, multiply, fill the earth. Eighth day. So the eighth day, they brought him there would circumcise the boy or present, dedicate the girl to God and to say, God, this is a moment. This is a child from you and for you and this is the vow that we make. We will raise this boy. We will raise this girl in the fear and the love of God. A covenant moment. We recognize this child is from God. It's more in eh? Moments like that. Or moments where the boy, the 13-year-old boy, 12, 13-year-old boy or girl has a bar mitzvah. And everyone in the town comes together and the priest comes with the father and they recognize that this boy is not a boy anymore, but this boy is a man. This is a covenant moment where his life now and forever changes and our view of this person changes forever. It's a covenant moment. It's a moment that doesn't just pass away, but it's here. Rhythms and rituals to stop, to say, to show that we live in the covenant of the great God. Our lives matter what we have, our relationships, our money, our possessions, everything has meaning. Life has meaning because of God's goodness in this. And we have this moment. 
secondly, I think this text also helps me. This is the end of the month for many of us, and for us, it's the, it's the very end of the month. Eh? It's the end of the month, and uh, it's the end of a long winter. And uh, we just come and we say, thank you, God. Thank you. And I want to invite you, because I never check the names and I never check the stuff, but I recognize that you are generous people, and that you generously give to God. And when you give this month, don't you just want to stop? And don't just do that EFT, or some of you have actually automated your giving. No? F&B decides, 10% go. But don't you just want to stop and make a moment of this? If you're married with your wife, with your husband, if you're not married, just to take a moment and perhaps just take bread and wine and just break it and say, God, I'm giving you this, but today we don't, money is an idea, God. It's on our phones, it's on our watches, it's in the bank or it's nowhere, you know. Money is, is in the air. It's, it's not as though you bring your cattle to God and say, this is the first, first of the calves, slaughter them and give them to, to the priests. We don't do that anymore. So we take away the ritual. But what I invite you to is if you wanna if you wanna not become secular, it means that the earning and giving has to has to have a moment. It's a covenant moment. The tithing you're giving is covenantal to God. It, it matters. Why do I give? Why do I give to the priest? Why do I give to the foreigner, to the widow, to the orphan? Why do I give a tenth of who I am? And for God's sake, at some point, have a conversation with your children to say, this is what I do every month, and this is why I do. If you want to raise him to not be secular, to not be self-serving, to not think that everything I have is, is my effort, but to re raise him in the reality of covenant, of everything, we have this land and we have this grapes, because God said he's going to bring us into a land flowing with milk and honey because of his faithfulness. A promise that he didn't make to me, a promise that he made to my fathers. He's good. And just to have that moment, to say, God, I'm going to give you this, but this is a moment where I bow down and I say, this is my basket. And if your basket's on your phone, just before you do the EFT, maybe just put down your basket to God and say, God, this is my basket. I'm going to give it to you. And just to say it, you know, I was a slave until you had mercy on me. And you saved me and you bound yourself to me and I'm blessed because of your goodness. I'm blessed because of your faithfulness. I have sufficient today because of your goodness. And you make that covenant vow and say, God, so God, I'm giving this back to you and I'm saying thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to spread it widely. God, I'll give to the orphan, the fatherless. I'll give to the ECB program. I'll give to the homeless guys. I'll give to whatever you give. But just say, God, the reason why I'm giving it's because I am someone mercyed by you, graced by you. You're good to me. Just to make a moment. Otherwise, the danger is it becomes secular. Either you hold on to your tradition and you forget why you do it, because we do forget. Or your children never learn what you do or why you do it. Because it's private. It's on the inside. It's a deep rhythm here. So that's why. The third thing take away from me and then I'm done third thing for me is just the, the royal priesthood man it's always been Deuteronomy is the place where you read over and over Exodus as well but Deuteronomy that he says listen you are to just later in this text just four verses later he says remember that you are a special people my loved people a chosen people and then later he says you are a holy kingdom of priests to me and that's what Paul and Peter grabs on, and John in Revelation grabs on always when they refer to the church. Who are we? Living stones built in a holy kingdom of priests to God to declare his glories to the world, to demonstrate, to demonstrate his glories to the world. An invitation is, is not just to, it's not just for you to have these touch points, but for you to create to recognize these touch points in your life, in your small group community, in your friends and your family, or perhaps with the neighbors, just to, just to facilitate these heaven to earth meetings. A priest is one who mediates between heaven and earth. He mediates between man and man, 
This is how we live, and this is how to sort conflict, how to come to justice. But primarily, to represent people to God, to represent, to connect people to God. Moments where you recognize that there is a great God, a great covenant God, the God creator of everything, the ruler of the world, the healer, the compassionate one, the God of justice, and to mediate on his behalf. To have these moments where we say to people, listen, because our world is secular and people have weird ideas, weird ideas, that you just be that voice and that faithful witness. When someone gives birth, maybe at your work, just to have it in a non-invasive, flat-out way, wow, can I pray with you with this child? God, I thank you for this child that you have given this family. Thank you for this life, you know? When someone has, comes into your office and he has a raise or someone joins your department, just to have a moment to say, thank you, I receive you. In him we live, we move, we have our being, and we just have a prayer and a conversation with this person. Just to facilitate and to officiate, to live with the reality that I am a holy, kingly, royal priest who mediates between heaven and earth. And the way in which the world will know that God is good and faithful is because of my witness. I am a priest. I'm one who witnesses for God and facilitates with God. Very simple. We'll unpack that next year when we go through Deuteronomy, but just to live through that. So <clears throat> I'm going to pray now. And um, Jacobus, can we upstate the sublet with our holy? Because I'm going to rustig the choir in a few sing. But as we, as we prepare to sing now, um, maybe if you can just close your eyes for a moment and just to, to live into the scene. I mean, in a very practical sense, you guys walked or drove here to church to meet with God. A place where you know you will meet with God, not just hear of God's word, but to actually meet with God. You came to meet with God, just like this Israelite in this text. And we don't take physical offerings, but perhaps you had something else of worship that you wanted to give God today. I want to invite you to see yourself in the presence of God, to see your possessions, what you have, the bags of stuff that you have, the house, the car, the family that you have, just to see it as gifts from God, to see God's faithful covenantal goodness to you in that. To remember moments of healing, to remember moments of deliverance, where God saved you from something big, where God prevented something bad from happening, just to remember those moments in God in prayer. And as we sing the song, I want you to see yourself as this, this Israelite who came to the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, Yahweh, his covenant God, and just affirm the reality of his life and his goodness in the presence of God, your blessed life in the presence of God. Father, we thank you for this morning. In you we live, we move, and we have our being. We thank you that we are your royal priests. We thank you that this morning, God, we can stand in your presence with our gifts, our baskets of goodness, and to say thank you. You are a good, faithful God. And then to ask God, God, would you bless us in Jesus' name?